Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar uh, from real time to photo real with Enscape and V-Ray. Uh, as you already know, my name is Anna, and I am your host today together with Kai. Hello, Kai. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, and we also have Josh Rado here with us. Um, he will be Hello. basically uh, helping us with handling your questions in the chat, and he will join us uh, for the Q&A session as well. Um, as you already know, uh, I'm, I have been the product manager of Vire for Revit for quite a while now, and uh, both my colleagues, uh, Kai and Josh, are part of uh, the Enscape application engineering team. Yeah, a few words about how this webinar is going to continue. We will start with a really brief overview on um, the V-Ray Bridge. Uh, what does it basically include? And then we will continue with the actual demo, which will start in Enscape, and then we'll continue in V-Ray uh, for Revit. And at the end, we will open up the Q&A session. So let's get started. Yeah, the V-Ray Bridge, most probably you have already heard about it, but what does it actually include? Um, the V-Ray Bridge allows the Enscape materials, 3D assets, and clouds configuration to be transferred to V-Ray seamlessly so that you can continue working on your renders and um, enhance their visual quality and bring it to photorealism. Uh, how does these things actually work and um, how to um, utilize them in a real workflow, we will now start exploring and we will start with our demo in Enscape, which will be led by Kai. So Kai, the stage is all yours now. Thank you, Anna. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kai Burival. I'm an applications engineer at Enscape. And my role today is going to be to yeah show you the, the first half the Enscape half show you uh, what Enscape is about. Um, Enscape or the Enscape to V-Ray bridge at the moment is a one-way route. So in my half of the presentation, we're going to prepare um, the model. We're going to gonna set up or we're going to go through the basic functionalities in Enscape and um, focus, of course, on the ones that will continue on into, into V-Ray later on. And we're going to prepare our scene a little bit and learn the basics, how to do that. So Anna can take over later on and um, build on what we've, what we've started. So uh, yeah, what is Enscape? First of all, <laughs> Enscape is a real-time rendering plugin for Revit, Rhino, Archicad, Vectorworks, and SketchUp. And the unique thing about Enscape is it's using real-time rendering technology to transfer the scene automatically. So I can just click the start button in the top left corner. And uh, what Enscape is going to do is it's, uh, it's, it's going to take all the information um, that we have in Revit in the scene automatically and um, transfer it into the Enscape engine and open in uh, its own separate window. It's currently opened on my second screen here. And the great thing is, without any additional effort, we get a great visualization to begin with. So, um, yeah, um, we can take the time and talk a little bit about, yeah, real time, or the, there we go already. Um, as you see, uh, we get a visualization or a interactable visualization um, that we can move through, change the daytime that we, I'm just going to, Align it on the right half of my screen here. And um, yeah, that we can interact with. So if I perform any changes to the model, which means if I um, change some, something on, on a window there, for example, um, you will see those changes happen in real time. By the way, the project that we're looking at here is a sample project that um, you can download from our website, the Enscape. Uh, website enscape3d.com. If you want to try it yourself, you can um, download it there and uh, yeah, have a look at it yourself. 
On the other hand, this is a model that is prepared for, for uh, Enscape. You see the assets. Um, but apart from that, that could be any model um, that you have in Revit with any kind of, of project. Um, materials are taken over correctly, automatically, et cetera. Um, the start button, by the way, um, it's now the pause live updates button, um, but it, that's everything it takes to convert any model into Enscape, to open it in Enscape, and uh, yeah, run it directly. And once again, as I said, if I perform any changes there, um, you will see uh, what, what yeah, you, there, there is a direct connection between Revit and Enscape. So for example, I can click on synchronize views, views which is the button that you see in the top left, um, the next to pause live updates. And um, my movement in Revit will take over to Enscape and synchronize over there. Um, exactly, or any other changes. If I change something on this window, for example, as you see, it will update in Enscape right away. So that is kind of the essence of Enscape. Um, you just continue working in Revit like you did anyways, and Enscape is gonna take those changes and uh, show them and interpret them. Exactly. Um, yeah, or if you change the section box, uh, sorry, if you uh, if you hide, for example, um, the the if you hide the element, if you hide the window, uh, sorry, the wall uh, on the model um, in Revit, in the view settings, or by right clicking on it, hiding it, that's going to be synchronized as well. The same thing as um, other things like section boxes, uh, design options, phases, whatever you change in Revit, uh, it's going to synchronize over to Enscape automatically. Even further, if we open the sun settings for a view, for example, and change the time to 15 o'clock, that's uh, 3 p.m., or um, yeah, switch to the location to Karlsruhe, that's where I live, um, we can see that the daytime changes in Enscape because, yeah, it's just, just, just sorry, taking the um, the settings from the Revit view, and if that updates, Enscape updates as well. Exactly. Um, by the way, we can also open the Enscape views. You can do that by pressing the F key or that button at the top. That one, uh, one second. There we go. Um, and if you open, uh, or if, if we have a look at that, we see that those are the identical views that we also have in Revit at that time. So any change, uh, sorry, any settings you have in those views, visibility settings, uh, daytime changes, something like that, all of that is being um, synchronized as well. So once again, it's just talking to each other, uh, Revit and Enscape, and um, which is great for, you know, uh, early designs, but, also while working visualization. And we can also change a little thing um, about the graphics by changing the visual settings. Um, we can, for example, switch to light view, which gives you a uh, overview of how much looks is falling onto each surface. So that's great. As I said, we can um, change or we can take the location from Revit that we are at and um, yeah, we see the correct values, not physically correct as it would be in V-Ray, um, but an estimation, which usually or oftentimes already is enough. Um, by the way, I'm changing the daytime here with shift and the right mouse button, and I move the mouse. And as you see, the lights from Revit are uh, taken directly as well. So once again, you just continue working like you do. We can also add some fog, for example, um, because that is also something that is going to carry over to V-Ray later um, and the the clouds, um, because that is also something that, that Anna is going to be working on or working with later on. And yeah, let's have a look what next. Yeah, um, 
the major topic actually that, that I want to discuss is materials, because I think that's yeah, the most important part in visualization in general. And um, there are multiple multiple ways in Enscape to work with uh, materials. First of all, you can imagine it, you can just continue working like you do anyways, uh, using the Revit material editor. Um, which means you can, yeah, um, yeah, open the material editor. Let's let's select the material that that we have on this on this wall. Go to edit type and brick exterior. So um, yeah, Enscape accesses the appearance tab uh, of the material editor. You can change that, but the appearance tab is the interesting part essentially for visualization and. Um, any textures you have there, any settings you change, any uh, um, textures you select will be, of course, um, used correctly. And here we're using just PBR textures. Or, yeah, we're using PBR textures for that material editor, but um, they're going to be used for the Enscape material editor later on as well. Anyways, um, I have the color texture here. I'm going to change the scale to 500 uh, centimeters. So we're we are seeing a little more detail. And yeah, OK, that's changed um, the entire scale of all the textures. So let me also replace the bump um, with this the displacement texture I have here. Make sure it's the same scale, 500 centimeters. And uh, here we go. So um, that's what I mean with this regular material editor we have in Revit um, with the regular tools, we can already achieve quite a lot um, by using just, you know, proper textures. Once again, PBR textures from an online source. And uh, it looks realistic right away. That's um, what it's all about. And yeah, we can change the color a little bit. Let's say, you know, the client wants to uh, to see a yellowish stone maybe or don't know, a greenish stone, something like that. And um, yeah, just by working as we as we do it in Revit anyways, uh, we can achieve quite realistic results really quick. So that's the Revit material editor. But there is also an Enscape material editor. Now you might might ask why exactly do we need the Enscape material editor if the Revit material editor is already so useful? Um, let's see. Oh yeah, so we are accessing the very same materials that we have in Revit as well. So I can open the same material here, and it is actually quite similar, or it's it's comparable. Um, but the Enscape material editor works a lot faster as you see here. So uh, we don't have to click apply. We see the changes happen right away. Apart from that, you know, both really powerful material editors. The Enscape material editor has one more really nice trick because it doesn't have to be an image file that you use as a texture. It can be a video. So you can choose a video file instead of a color texture. And that will run the video in Enscape so obviously you probably won't use that for a facade like I did, but you know, for a billboard, for an advert, monitor, something like that, it's great. All right. But maybe we don't want to um to put any time into our materials. So there's one more way to, to, to edit your materials for, you know, Enscape and then later on for Revit, uh, which is the material library, the Enscape material library, which we can access by clicking on the, uh, one second, there we go, by clicking on these three, three little dots and choosing replace with Enscape material. I'm gonna do it one more time so you can, you can see better these three little dots. Replace, replace with Enscape material. And the 
cool thing about this is if you click on a material, it's going to uh, update an Enscape in real time as well. So you can create a, you know, or get an overview really, really fast and pick something that, that fits those materials created by our 3, 3D artists. So you can use them, obviously, in your projects. Click replace if you like one. And it's going to transfer the material over and create a Revit material from it. So once again, we can access it in both material editors and change it if we want to. So we can open it in Revit and, for example, make it greenish by clicking image fade or dialing down image fade and affecting the color with it. So <clears throat> yeah, that's also really quick and fast, as you see, and great for design iterations. Yeah, and one more time, regular textures. So where, wherever you get your textures from, they should work right away. OK, um, one more major topic, of course, is the Enscape asset library. So just like we have a material library that um, contains a selection of materials, we also have an asset library with 3D models, also comparable to Chaos Cosmos, if you know it from, from uh, Chaos, of course that 3D asset library. And um, in Enscape, you can find currently more than 3,000 assets, models, and those are optimized for uh, real time. So you can, um, or they have enough detail to look astonishing and high quality, um, but they're really, really um, um, smart with their, with their uh, design. So they have, um, they're optimized for real time, so so you you can place a lot of them, and they will uh, perform well on your graphics card. That's its own topic in itself. Like we could uh, talk about custom assets. You can import your own material, uh, sorry, models in OBJ, FBX, or GLTF format. Um, here we'll focus on some of our assets, the Enscape assets, and have a look at those. So we have uh, you know different cate categories, people. Plants, we have trees, so you you might have noticed that those move in Enscape in the wind. That's simply because we can give them that, that ability for Enscape. So uh, yeah, and they're really optimized on the Revit side. So um, as you see, we have sleek models um, with low geometry or yeah, low detail on the Revit side and high detail on the Enscape side. So um, Revit still performs well. We can also open the Enscape asset library on the Enscape side. Just one second here. So yeah, we can open it on the Enscape side. Oh, sorry, uh, we can, let's first of all place one uh, in Revit. So. Um, we can just directly place them as usual. Sorry, yeah, um, th there we go. So uh, we can place them as usual objects and um, they will have their placeholder placed on the Revit site as usual. Um, and let's see where I placed it. Should be somewhere here. There is a car next to it. Ah, there she is. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, so we've placed the asset um, right there. And as you see, we have a simple placeholder um, on the Revit side. And um, yeah, we can also place assets directly inside of Enscape. We can open um, the same asset library there that we uh, also access in Revit. And we can actually pick a selection of assets, just like here, um, to place randomly to scatter in the scene. So I'm just going to pick some more. There we go. And now we can pick a way to place them in the scene. So we have a square selection, circular selection, 
and uh, we can just select a whole surface. So I'm going to pick a square selection, paint a path here, and we could change some values like the width of the path, uh, the density um, placed in different D, but I'm just going to click apply changes and Enscape is going to transfer those, uh, those assets or the placeholders, the positions uh, over into our Revit scene. And that means we um, still have, you know, uh, a consistent model and everything stays in your Revit model the entire time. So you can also um, give it over to V-Ray later on. All right, let's see. Um, there is one more thing that I would like to show you. I think we're running low, low on time, but one more thing that I would uh, just briefly like to show you because there is one more way to place your Enscape assets. And those are um, by linking them or that's by linking them to an existing, existing Revit family. Um, I can do that by clicking on these three little dots there and clicking link Revit family to asset. So that means if you have a family already placed in your model, um, you can just tell Enscape to instead show that asset. And that means you have even more control uh, or even, yeah, more options to choose from where to have what detail. Um, so just keep in mind, you can also replace existing families with your assets. But then also in the rem remaining time, I would like to um, talk about uh, exports and um, in general, exports in Enscape are quite simple and straightforward. We can just click that screenshot button there. Let me actually just add a little bit of depth of field here. Uh, just a habit kind of. And now we can click the screenshot button and Enscape is going to save the image. And as usual, uh, when you're working on half by half, um, you get the, the, the position wrong or the, the aspect ratio. So I'm going to enable the save frame up here. Um, and it's going to show me what Enscape is uh, going to render as an image. So let's do that quickly. Um, while it's rendering, I want to share a QR code in a couple of seconds. So I'm going to render a panorama. Now I want to share it with you via QR code. So if you have a QR code ready phone, um, get it out and you can see it yourself. Then we can also... For example, export EXE standalones, uh, which is a copy of Enscape that is detached from Revit. So you can, you know, share your whole model one click. Um, that is also VR compatible. So we didn't talk about VR at all yet, um, but that too is is working with Enscape, and um, you can even customize it. By the way, so um, yeah. Last but not least, the panorama. So let's create a mono panorama, we could create a stereo panorama as it's, as you see it here, um, which would be for Google Cardboard, for example. So a mobile phone based uh, VR solution. Um, actually, I, th I think I'm going to cancel the panorama because we are really running out of time, but I have one prepared, which is not even uploaded yet. So let me just uh, upload it using the upload management here. Click this button. And now it should be ac accessible through the Enscape Cloud. If you're quick, you can uh, pick the QR code, or I'm going to post it in the chat later if anybody, anybody wants to. All right. Um, or we can just open it in the browser. And with that, sorry. Uh, I think I've clicked too early, but with that, I give, give it over to Anna. Uh, Anna. Yeah, thank you so much, Kai, for this super cool demo. Uh, I really like Enscape and Revit, uh, and I really like the fact that uh, now we can transfer all the assets and stuff uh, to V-Ray. So in this second part of the demo, uh, we will continue exploring several workflows 
um, we will start with the actual V-Ray bridge and transferring uh, your Enscape data to V-Ray. And then we will explore some additional workflows uh, which you can uh, apply um, if you want to bring your images to photorealism. So uh, yeah, starting with workflow number one. So this is uh, what we already saw in Enscape, our still image. And uh, uh, right now I'm going to recreate it with V-Ray. So I have set our rendered view to that same camera. I keep the resolution and quality low. And I also enable the V-Ray denoiser. Um, well, this is basically an engine which will allow us to see the image um, rendered with, without noise. Uh, yeah, so we are running V-Ray's interactive rendering, which will allow us to see all the changes we do interactively. So as you can see, all the Enscape assets, these are all Enscape assets, like the trees and the cars, they just render out of the box. And uh, we are now going to transfer the clouds. Um, the clouds in V-Ray basically have the same settings and there is this match with Enscape settings. So if you right click here, uh, you see all the Enscape settings presets and you can import the cloud settings from the preset you want. Um, whereas if you click, uh, if you left click that button, uh, you just adopt the cloud settings from the current uh, Enscape settings preset. So uh, yeah, we, we just adopted the cloud settings in a click. And now um, we are going to continue uh, with the materials uh, because in order to transfer uh, the Enscape materials, you need to enable that setting here. And what it basically does is that it reads the Enscape data that is saved within um, the Revit native materials. And you see those materials here in orange, you can either promote them to the very asset editor or replace them and we will now see how uh, replacement works because this is sort of an essential workflow in V-Ray for Revit. We replace materials and geometries. So we basically don't, um, we don't import them in the Revit model. Uh, we only render them. So I will pick that material here um, and I will replace it with another one, um, which I will, import from the Chaos Cosmos library. Uh, this is the library of materials, 3D assets, HDRIs, compatible and optimized um, for rendering with V-Ray. I just drag and drop that material and it is being replaced. Now, I, um, the next uh, thing that I really want to show you uh, is our linked replacements workflow. So if that was uh, a real project, most probably the terrain would have been a linked file. And that's why I have split it in another file. And I gave it to my colleague from our 3D department in order to work on its very settings. And here I can see several modes for the replacements that are coming from my linked file. So I will just set those replacements to view and override, and I will merge the identical items. So I only see these three materials that do not exist in my main file, and the pavement is replaced with a V-Ray material. And I'm doing the same uh, with the families that were replaced with V-Ray assets in that linked file. But I am not opening the file all the time. I'm just... Um, working it, with it from within my main file. And this is the image that I have. Um, here I just um, import a layer preset. We will see and explore how layers in the very frame buffer work uh, a little bit later on. In that case, I just uh, use a ready-made preset, again, created by my colleague. And here I already have my images rendered in a higher resolution and we can uh, compare our uh, photorealistic image with the one we uh, produced from Enscape. Of course, as I said at the beginning, this is just the base and uh, you decide how further to uh, basically go um, 
making the image realistic. So here, this is another example where we uh, rendered the building with another uh, material on the facade. And here you can see the level of detail. Uh, Anna, sorry to interrupt, interrupt you, but those puddles, uh, could you show us how, how to make those? Those are uh, look astonishing. Yeah, sure. So uh, the puddles, uh, they were created specifically for that demo and for that particular visualization. So they're using their own uh, texture, uh, but essentially they're created using the Vray blend material. So uh, Vray has a large variety of materials that are applicable in specific situations and the blend material is one of those materials so uh here is for you to see how it works uh it requires a base material and also a coat at least one coat and both these are mixed based on a texture map and you can either use one of the uh built-in texture maps in v-ray or create your own in my case, I'm using one of the built-in noise textures. And here you can see that with some tweaks um, to the size and the phase of the noise, you can, you can create any pattern. So the, the red, the big red spots are actually the puddles. So uh, now to make that material realistic, I will find the pavement. I have the same pavement in my main file and I promote it to the very asset editor. And then I just need to drag and drop it as a base of the blend material. And then I have a reflective material that is really simple, uh, which I place as a code. Now, if you want to go really advanced, uh, this setup requires also a middle layer, um, uh, which will basically depict the slightly wet pavement that doesn't have that much water on top of it. So. Uh, I just duplicate the pavement we have and make it uh, much more darker. Yeah, like that. And we can then um, drag and drop it as the as the second coat uh, of the blend material. And we also need to copy the same map that will um, that will blend the materials together. And that's basically it. So you don't need to have uh, a specific texture uh, in order to uh, create puddles or whatever material comes to your mind. Yeah, so uh, in our next workflow, um, we are going to create realistic grass using V-Ray. Uh, grass is a, is a feature which is not part of the V-Ray bridge conversion. Uh, and there is a reason behind that. Um, in Enscape, you can have uh, a grass field or a mountain covered with grass. Uh, whereas in V-Ray, if you transfer that huge amount of grass, um, there could be some decrease in performance because V-Ray would render every uh, grass strand. So um, here is how to recreate um, the grass. And I'm using the same model, but another view. Uh, and we will be working with uh, that um, piece of grass at the foreground. Uh, it is assigned a grass material. And here is how to create grass in V-Ray. You need to click the geometry creation menu. And there are several geometries which you can create from that menu. And you need to select the fur geometry. So uh, yeah, its name is kind of more universal because you can not only use it to create grass, but also any kind of carpets, etc. And you can see the parameters um, that allow you to have fine control on everything, starting from uh, grass length, thickness, bend of the strands, variance, 
and you can also uh, map the grass with its own parameter and also control the parameters with a texture map. So this is another workflow that we're going to explore how exactly to control the grass parameters using textures. And for that purpose, I have these textures over here. And in order to understand how will they affect my grass, I have mapped them to that material. So the areas that are white uh, would mean maximum value for the grass parameter that we're going to control. Whereas the areas that are grayish or black will mean um, lower value or minimum of that parameter. So if we map the grass density with uh, this um, uh, gradient map, uh, we will have maximum density over here. And in the black areas, there will be uh, minimum density. So now let's see um, how this will work. Uh, I have these couple of materials uh, for the soil and for the grass itself. So the grass material would go to our grass asset. I'll just drag and drop it like that. And then the soil material goes to what we see on the rendering like that. And then we also drag and drop the grass and you will see that indicator that the grass is associated with the material. If you want to remove it, you need to click here in that um, very replacements menu. And uh, yeah, our grass, uh, well, I have increased all the parameters on purpose so that we can actually uh, see the grass and be able to see all the individual strands. And I will now just drag and drop the gradient texture uh, into the density slot. And as you can see, uh, yeah, it basically controls the density of the grass strands. If I remove it, and use the grid, the other texture that we explored, but this time I plug it to the length parameter and I would decrease the density so that we can see how we have maximum uh, length here and uh, here um, the strands are shorter. And if we move that color to light gray, uh, they would become longer like that. And then my final uh, grass setup, I'm using again a couple of noise B textures that are plugged into the density and the length of the grass. And both these textures are slightly rotated so that we have this final result. And I also rendered this image uh, on Chaos Cloud in higher resolution. And we can now see how it looks like if we zoom in. Yeah, this is how it looks like. Yeah, workflow number three, um, creating a really quick night rendering setup uh, because, well, in very, you can achieve a night rendering uh, pretty easily, like in a few clicks. And then again, it's up to you how further uh, you would want to go uh, with photorealism. So uh, this is the daytime rendering we have. And uh, I just changed the environment light to dome light, uh, which basically creates a hemisphere above the Revit model. And that hemisphere can be mapped with an HDRI and the lighting is based on that HDRI. And here in Chaos Cosmos, you can find so many HDRIs for day, for night setups, etc. And then the next step is to enable the artificial lights from the global switch. And then we're going to work on the foreground materials uh, because we want to make them again, a little bit wet to create that uh, rainy or after the rain atmosphere. So all the time I'm using this uh, pick material tool, which allows you to pick a surface uh, from the Revit viewport and you see only that material uh, of, the, of the picked surface. Yeah, so uh, 
I will now promote the road material. As you can see, it is an landscape material because it is indicated in orange. So I'm holding control on my keyboard and that button, which you already saw. And now I will enhance that promoted material by adding textures to its reflection slots, um, as well as uh, into the bump. And again, uh, I have this, these textures um, ready-made by one of my colleagues. So uh, the only thing that I need to do is to um, paste them into that material. Okay, now the next thing is that um, I still need something in the foreground of my image over here, uh, maybe some reflections or just something in the foreground. And for this, I have already used uh, V-Ray decals, uh, but they're hidden, so I need to unhide them. Um, yeah, decals are a new feature for V-Ray 6, and um, they work as native Revit families. And we will now discuss how they uh, work. It is uh, really easy, and they allow you to uh, basically project any material on any surface, including multiple surfaces. So you can place them either on level or on face. Uh, and they appear as generic cube-like family where you can control the size of the projected material as well as the depth because uh, the decal can project the material on multiple surfaces that are within its boundaries. Um, and also if you have decals that are overlapping, you can set the order of projection. And uh, yeah, you need to assign them with the Revit material. Uh, whereas if you want to mask uh, part of the decal, you need to create a texture in the very asset editor and then type in its name uh, next to the mask parameter. So in that setup, I have again, uh, a puddles material that is utilizing the noise B texture. But instead of creating a material, um, we are plugging all these to the decal. So this is, uh, yeah, this is my final uh, result. Uh, I'm using also a couple of decals uh, for some uh, asphalt patches. And uh, yeah, I forgot to mention that most of the assets that I'm using here besides this car uh, are actually the original uh, Enscape assets. Also that tree over here, uh, it is a very asset. So uh, at the places where I needed more detail, I um, changed the landscape assets. But well, as you can see, most of the assets that I'm using are those that came from landscape, and I don't need to do anything further. My next step is to create fog. And uh, V-Ray offers a, a couple of options to create fog. If you look at the lights over here, after we enable the V-Ray fog, we will have this volumetric lighting effect, which we will continue working with once we have our final image. And if, if you have noticed, all the lights are um, kind of white, they're not uh, tinted. And uh, that was also made on purpose. And uh, we are going to adjust all the lights using the light mix feature um, of V-Ray. And in order to use it, we need to enable it from the channels tab. So right here, uh, we have control over um, various render elements and uh, light mix is one of them. So from here, you need to select a grouping method for your lights. This is how you will see them in the V-Ray frame buffer after you render your final image. And uh, this is how you will be able to um, modify them. So in my case, I have many lights that are grouped. So I picked the light groups method. And um, if you have linked files, you can also include or exclude them uh, from the light mix. And here I'm also adding all the render elements, including the masking ones, 
because again, I will need them uh, when I start um, doing post-processing in the V-Ray frame buffer. Here, I also increased the resolution and I set the quality to high plus and I exported that rendering to Chaos Cloud in order to save time. So uh, yeah, in V-Ray, um, you have a variety of rendering modes, like uh, you can render interactively what we already saw. And this is um, appropriate when, you, when you're still working on your image and you want to uh, test things out. And um, then if you want to render your final image, you could either render it locally using the production rendering mode, or uh, you can render it on Chaos Cloud. Uh, or uh, you can use the so-called um, distributed rendering feature, uh, which uh, allows you to distribute your um, rendered image on multiple machines and um, render it on them. Uh, there is also batch rendering. So if you have several renders and you want to render them sequentially, you can do that either on your local machine or um, you can do that on the cloud. So uh, yeah, workflow number four, and that's uh, I think the last workflow for today and before we officially open the Q&A, uh, light mix and compositing in the V-Ray frame buffer. So uh, our final image can be loaded from here or uh, from within the V-Ray frame buffer history uh, where I have already saved my image. And uh, in the right-hand side panel, uh, you have the layered compositor, which we are going to explore. Um, so we will start with um, understanding that uh, the source has three modes, RGB, light mix, and composite. And by default, uh, you are starting with the source set to RGB, where you can add various color corrections to your image. And if you were familiar with the first version of the very frame buffer, these are the color corrections that existed there. Well, we have some new uh, among them, uh, such as the filmic tone map, uh, which allows you to apply a tone mapping curve to your image. And there are various types which uh, you can explore and uh, play with the settings, as you can see here. And uh, yeah, the, the layers uh, are stacked on top of each other. So uh, you should be careful with that and uh, with the way you arrange them. Uh, so in my case, I have a couple of um, background layers which I'm using as foreground. So I want to keep them on top of, of the whole stack. So uh, yeah, um, this is how the color balance works. Uh, for the shadows, midtones, and highlights. And uh, I have prepared my color balance layer in advance. So I will delete that one that I just created. And uh, yeah, this is how uh, it looks like. Here are the settings that I'm using. And uh, you can also create a layer and um, pick a mask and apply that layer only to the mask that you have picked. So if I pick that wall, um, I can click on show preview when selected and see what exactly I have selected. And then I can um, slightly adjust the exposure so that uh, that wall is a little bit lighter compared to uh, the other, but just a little bit. And I can repeat that um, for, the, for the left uh, wall but in order to make it a little bit darker like that, uh, because, <laughs> uh, because I want to make that edge here uh, more uh, well visible. And then if we switch the source to light mix, here I have all the light groups uh, that we specified when we enabled the light mix. 
so here I have the lights by floors and I can uh, disable some of them. So this will disable the whole group or um, I can, for example, increase or decrease the intensity of the whole light group or I can change the color. And this is, this is really cool because you can play with all the lights on your image and at the end you can save a preset. Uh, in my case, I saved four presets in advance, like four variants. And once you load one of them, uh, well, you need to keep them all in the same folder. And when you click here, you can switch from one variant to another immediately and uh, compare, uh, compare. Yeah, so in my case, I would go with variant number four, where I have uh, disabled some of the lights in the building to create a little bit more, uh, you know, dramatic uh, look. Um, yeah, and uh, the next step would be uh, if you want to continue working on your lights while you're doing compositing, you click to compose it and all your lights adjustments would switch the source automatically to compose it and will be stored there as layers. As you can see, we also have layers of the disabled light groups because we might want to enable some of them. We might want to disable other groups. Um, now, in, in this case, you might want to also add masks to them. Um, the possibilities are basically uh, limitless. So here I create another folder. Uh, I call it fog and I will extract uh, the render element that holds the fog. In our case, that's the atmosphere. Um, but mind that every time you select the render element, you would start with the RGB and you will need to navigate to that particular render element that you need. So uh, in my case, I'm coloring the fog in something bluish and you can um, see, you can play with the multiplier and increase or decrease that color of the fog. <clears throat> And then we can also add some lens effects. Again, uh, lens effects were a feature that existed in the previous version of the very frame buffer. Uh, and we have them uh, quite improved here. Uh, so uh, you need to uh, work with the size and the intensity and the lens effect would create uh, those uh, star, star shapes around some of the lights. Uh, and yeah, you can configure uh, where exactly uh, to make them appear. And you can also um, switch between uh, bloom and glare. like that. Okay, and the last but not the least, definitely uh, the background layers, which I previously mentioned, I'm using them as foreground. Um, so uh, layer number one is adding some vignetting in the corners of this image. And the other one was just an experiment adding a mask, uh, which looks like raindrops. Uh, and uh, yeah, it is, it is a grayscale uh, mask and I reduced the opacity even further so that we just see it just a little bit. And uh, that's uh, basically it. As you can see, uh, the possibilities are um, endless and uh, you can uh, just, uh, decide how further to go uh, with your rendered images. Way to develop a design. Thank you, Anna. Awesome. Awesome. And we're in the, yeah, and we're in the Q and A. Yeah, uh, thanks guys for that. That was awesome. Thank you. And uh, Josh, you've been picking some some questions for us. Yeah. from the chat. Am I right? Yep, absolutely. Uh, Kai, how about this one? How is exposure handled from going from external to internal? 
Uh -huh. So from, from bright to dark, essentially. Um, okay. So if you have in the visual settings, um, the exposure, if auto exposure is enabled, um, Enscape um, controls the exposure, the brightness um, automatically or more trying to, to, uh, to imitate a human eye. Um, so in that case, it goes it goes automatically with a certain you know uh, value. If um, auto exposure is disabled, it's not being changed at all and just being controlled by your slider. Awesome, thank you for that. Uh, got another one for you, real quick. Are the Enscape assets the same as the Chaos Cosmos assets in V-Ray for Revit? They're not. Um, they're still separate. Am I right, Anna? Um, but they will still uh, appear yes. in V-Ray. Yes, for now they are separate. Um, well, the basic difference is that both types of assets are optimized um, for the respective render engine. So the Enscape assets are optimized to um, render quickly with Enscape because Enscape is real time and the performance is really uh, crucial. Whereas uh, the Chaos Cosmos assets are optimized for photorealism. But um, we hope that in the future, we will have both of them combined into one asset. Awesome. Thank you. All right, Anna, one for you. Uh, tips for getting V-Ray Interactive to run faster. Uh, yeah. So tip number one, uh, in the view that you render, make sure that you enable section box and uh, adjust it so that uh, the rest of your scene is cut it by the section box. Uh, this will speed up uh, the export of the geometry from Revit to the render engine. So I think this is universal and probably it is also applicable to Enscape, but probably Josh and Kai can confirm or not. Uh, or probably not because yeah, it's real time. Uh, anyway, so yeah, tip number Perfect. one is enable the section box. Tip number two is um, use the render region, the one which you uh, saw that I'm using and uh, work on small portions of your image. Uh, yeah, and other than that, um, if you experience any uh, slowdowns, uh, maybe it is good to contact us. Uh, so that we can debug the model that you're uh, using. Perfect, thank you. All right, how about one more for you? Uh, if you have a skybox, if you have a skybox in Enscape, will that transfer over to V-Ray? Mm, no, it it won't. But you can use it in both. You can use, like, use the same yeah. HDR file. Yeah, you, can, you can use it in both. V-Ray will create its own uh, sun and sky system, or yep. uh, you can replace the sun with the uh, dome light, which I showed you, mm -hmm. uh, which is also part of the, well, another type of environment lighting. Perfect. Thank you. All right. This one's kind of um, thrown out there to both. After applying and changing materials in V-Ray, is it possible to see them? export them back to Enscape and be able to see them in virtual reality in real time? Uh, I would say not yet, uh, because as we said at the beginning, the bridge, uh, the, the current state of the bridge works in one direction and the direction is from Enscape towards V-Ray. Thank you. Another one. Very cool webinar. Can we get access to the image that you showed, the final rendering that you showed? Uh, not completely sure to the final rendering, but uh, that model rendered with V-Ray uh, is already available for sharing. Um, and the Enscape version of it is available on the Enscape website, right? Yeah, right. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Is there a place if someone wants to get a basic course of V-Ray and a more in-depth course of V-Ray? Is there somewhere where they can do that? Uh, I would recommend subscribing for our YouTube channel uh, and also having a look at our documentation because these are uh, the, I would say the, the best resources to start with. 
Uh, and also we make sure that they're updated with all the new features and with all the new workflows that we uh, introduce. So uh, yeah, have a look at our YouTube channel. Uh, depending on the host application that you're using, we have plenty of tutorials uh, as well as quick start videos that are um, really short but full of information. So yeah, this is what I could recommend. Kai, here's one for you. Uh, is there an online library where you can download even more uh, Enscape assets? Even more Enscape assets? Uh, we provide them all. Um, almost. There are sometimes a certain, uh, what, what's the English word? <laughs> uh, certain, um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm lacking the word right now. But you can enter a code sometimes um, and you get oh, yeah. a Don't couple exactly exactly but um those are you know the the the, the exemption and uh, other than that we share all of the assets uh with everyone so um not that i know do you know anything other than the promo codes and creating custom assets um yeah, yeah sure some... like once again maybe just to highlight that you can create your own assets um from obj fbx gltf which are the industry most used uh 3d formats so you can absolutely get models from anywhere and make them your own Enscape assets. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, so um, yeah, I see a couple more questions which I can uh, answer. Um, so the first one is what is the effect of removing or keeping the denoiser? What is it controlling and does it help keep off while interactive rendering. Okay, so uh, the denoiser has three modes. We have the default V-Ray denoiser, um, which allows you to specify um, how much noise you want to remove from your, from your image or not. Then we have the NVIDIA AI denoiser, which uses uh, AI to remove the noise from the image. And then we have the Intel open image denoiser. So these are three modes of the denoiser. And yes, it is quite recommended using it when you run V-Ray interactive rendering because the denoiser will help you uh, achieve a noise-free image faster. And again, use it as a reference before you run your final uh, and high resolution rendering, so to speak. Uh, yeah, the other question is uh, if we can discuss the light gen uh, and what it does. Yes, we can. Uh, for that purpose, um, I need to share my other screen. So I need to stop sharing that one. Okay, let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah. Yeah. See your screen. And hopefully you can also hear me <laughs> as well. Okay. So what LightGen basically does is that um, it creates lighting scenarios for uh, either interior or exterior. And you can specify uh, whether you want those scenarios uh, for the very sun position or you want them for a dome light. So in case you are using HDRI images, you can say um, how many images you would want to use and uh, how many times you want them rotated. And based on that, uh, the light gen would create uh, as many lighting scenarios as you define and you can uh, they would appear as uh, thumbnails and you can pick them um, and apply them immediately to your rendering or you can also save them as a preset and use them uh, further on awesome thank you for all that let's see and uh, you got time for one more? Yeah. Uh, any settings you would recommend for users to have on or off for final rendering? 
uh that's a pretty wide question which uh i can't just uh, answer straightforward and it really depends on the scene uh whether it is a daylight exterior or it is a nightlight exterior whether it's interior etc uh yeah you you might end up with pretty different settings so there is no um nothing strictly recommended cool. thank you how about uh what is the difference between gpus cuda and rtx render engine uh, so uh, they both utilize the NVIDIA uh, card, so um, the NVIDIA GPU. So uh, the CUDA mode would render using the CUDA cores, whereas the RTX uh, is basically compatible with the RTX GPUs. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you, Josh. By the way, uh, yeah, another question I see here in the chat if Chaos Cosmos is free if you purchase Vray, yes, it is, uh, and it comes with every uh installation of Vray. Uh, and yeah, it is good to mention that uh, Chaos Cosmos is a feature that exists across all Vray uh integrations, uh, which means that it is not only a Revit specific feature, you can find it in SketchUp Rhino, um, 3ds Max. Maya, Cinema 4D, etc. So uh, you can basically have the same assets across uh, the V-Ray applications you might use. Perfect. Kai, does uh, Enscape uh, assets come with uh, all included when you purchase Enscape? Yes. Cool. We'll stop. Like everything else, by the way, everything is included in your subscription. Ready. Well, thank you guys. This was all awesome. Thank you guys for showing us all this. Thanks for having us. Thank you everyone for, for watching, being with us. And I think that's it for today. Yes, thanks everyone. We hope this webinar was useful. Uh, like we announced it at the beginning, or I actually don't remember if we announced it or not. <laughs> this webinar is being recorded and it will also be uploaded on our YouTube channels and social media. So uh, yeah, you will be able to watch the game and practice what we showed. And thanks again for joining. Bye, stay safe. Bye, everybody.